Tijuana. 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 Tijuana is innovation and manufacturing at a world-class level. A skilled and high-tech industrial labor. The San Diego's business and economic partner is the gateway to a smarter border, is a dynamic destination, and our gateway to Mexico. Is diverse and inclusive, is binational and bicultural. It is a hub of art and cultural innovation. It's surprising, a place that will open your eyes. It's a treasure trove of wonderful food, beer, and wine. It's part of San Diego's binational community. It's social innovation and philanthropy is San Diego's innovative, dynamic, and vibrant collaborator. Tijuana is an open and plural society, a cluster of many communities that welcomes everyone. Tijuana is our friend, our neighbor, and our partner. Tijuana. 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 Tijuana is the future. ¿Cómo están? Buenas tardes. Qué gusto saludarlas y saludarlos el día de hoy. Pues estamos muy contentas porque eh, el día de hoy tenemos a nuestro queridísimo uh, Jeff Light. Y eh, el día de hoy vamos a platicar en inglés. Y recuerden que tenemos en el Facebook abierto para sus preguntas. Pueden hacerlas en español o en inglés. Y aquí nosotros vamos a trabajar con Jeff sobre todo lo que quieran preguntarle. So, hello everyone. We are so happy to have you today here on our webinar A Tiempo y Bien. And we're going to talk um, with Jeff Light, who is the publisher and editor-in-chief of the San Diego Union Tribune. So, hello Jeff. How are you today? I am doing great. Very glad to be here, Claudia. I, uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. And also, Jose Galicot, president and founder of the Tijuana Innovadora. Señor Galicot, buenos, buenas tardes. Good day for everybody. I'm very happy to be with Jeff. I admire him. He's, a, he's one of, I am his fan. <clears throat> and through our <laughs> lives, we have done very interesting things together, and he has been a real friend of Mexico and real friend of Tijuana, and I am delighted to have him here. Thank you. And of course, um, Gaby Palazuelos, which is on the technical control, and also she's the director of the Paseo de la Fama Hall of Fame in Tijuana. So um, let me give you a brief introduction to this uh, season that we are dedicating to the binational people. The Tijuana-San Diego region refers to the area that includes the city of Tijuana, located in the state of Baja California, Mexico, and the city of San Diego, located in California in the United States. The international border separates these two cities, and despite being two different countries, they are closely connected due to their geographical proximity and the commercial, cultural, and social relations they share. The Tijuana-San Diego region is one of North America's most dynamic and diverse regions, and its unique cross-border relationship has created many opportunities and challenges. One of those opportunities and challenges is journalists. That's why we have our dear Jeff Light today, and I'm going to give you a brief Um, resume of Jeff, but we're going to discover him through our um, chat today. So Jeff grew up in Buffalo, New York, where his father was editor of the local newspaper. During the last three decades, he has worked for newspapers and their websites. He has been an editor, reporter, and employee. He believes that journalism is one of the most important calls of society. He studied poetry and creative writing at Brown University and holds an MBA from the University of California, Irvine. He began as in-house writer in Syracuse, New York. As a newspaper journalist, he was a member of a Pulitzer Prize winning staff and led project teams that were Pulitzer 
finalist. He joined the San Diego Union Tribune as editor in March 2010, and in March 2016, he was promoted to the dual role of publisher and editor-in-chief. What a proud moment. Jose Galicot? How, how you can work in newspaper in these years? What's happening in the newspaper? Everything is changing. The way to communicate, the technology, many things that are happening every day. And it, the, the, the way to communicate has changed a lot. What do you think about the challenge that that makes to your diary and to yourself? Yeah. Yeah, big big question. You know, I uh, uh, I feel like we've known each other for for years, Senor Gareco, but I think we're going to talk about things today we've never actually gone through. You and me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, obviously the newspaper business tremendous change. Now, many industries are challenged uh, uh, by the the advent of the digital era, but I would say for newspapers. Uh, a couple of things. One, these are local businesses, right? So uh, our franchise is uh, the greater San Diego era, includes the, includes the whole cross-border uh, region, right? San Diego, Tijuana, the up to Oceanside, right? And then out into the desert. Uh, that is the basis of a business it's the oldest business in San Diego. It goes back to like the 1850s. Think about that. So now with the advent of the digital age, though, the digital world is global in scale. So one, the first challenge for newspapers is, oh, you're trying to operate a local business in a global marketplace suddenly, right? M many uh, retailers face the same challenge, right? I, I know you're a great business mind. So I'm thinking about it sort of from a business perspective. So that's one challenge. The other big challenge is historically these were advertising companies, right? So there was this great alignment between how far you could drive the newspaper and deliver it and still get the uh, Padre score in or the Zonky score, right? Or the Shola score. Uh, uh, and, and how far people would uh, drive to work or to go to school, or to shop, very importantly, right? So that analog footprint in our lives, our communities that we know, fit together with their commercial, our commercial lives. And that made newspapers a very profitable industry for more than 100 years. Of course, now you, you don't need to drive anywhere to shop or work or go to school. And so... Advertising business has also fundamentally changed. So really, these are becoming subscriber-driven properties. There's a lot to think about there, and I, I'm sure you've got more follow-up questions, but sort of that's the framework of what's going on. How could these creatures of the machine age, children of the printing press, of that technology, uh, how can they move on and exist in a world where all the fundamentals have changed, but our sense of community remains very powerful, right? So that's the that's the uh, the struggle, and I think a very important struggle, by the way, for communities as well as for these businesses. That's what we're engaged in now. One thing is the public is also changing. Young people are doing different things. Uh, we we have to talk in another language, in another way. It appears intelligence, artificial intelligence, and, the, and the, mm. they can write faster or doer. And everything, it, the only thing that doesn't change is that things change. So how we can cope in a world that is changing in a in in, in a newspaper? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God! Such a good question. Now. Like, unlike you, I don't have the time machine where I can see. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the information environment has changed altogether. Absolutely. Right. So now we are all immersed constantly in a flow of both 
uh, um, creative information, uh, journalistic information, commercial information, propaganda information. Very important. And um, uh, when, when you think about the fundamentals, like, well, I have my own ideas, my worldview, my values. These are the filters that I use to make my way through the world. But where do those things come from? And the answer is, well, they come from your family, your peers, and everything that's going in here. So you are immersed in an information environment, and that information environment is shaping you uh, absolutely, shaping your thoughts, shaping your your opinions, shaping your values. So um, we have entered a world that I don't think we've been in before. And uh, it's going to be pretty consequential how we all how we all navigate through that. I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering your question because I don't think I know the answer, but it is certainly uh, a, uh, I think it's a very important time. Very important time. Because once we become unglued from uh, the establishmentarian information world, right? This is what happened. This is what happened uh, 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 with Guten, with the Gutenberg uh, uh, printing press, right? So let's go way back. So so back in the oh my god, which century? You you you're going to be better than me. Uh, the fifteenth uh, century. century, maybe the sixteenth century, the fifteen hundreds. But yeah, you, you might be right because um, I know you're very uh, very uh, uh, well read and very well informed. Okay, the world of information in that era was held very to a very small group. The, the priests, the scholars in the monasteries of, uh, of, uh, of Europe and Eurasia, uh, the, the biblical uh, uh, books were copied out by hand. They were the great treasures. So information was very orthodox and very tightly held. Then came this idea, oh, the printing press, we could mass produce. And even though the first thing they printed was the Bible, everything was different because now all sorts of people could sh have information. They could read, they could discover new things, they could see through other people's eyes, and pretty soon you had the Protestant uh, uh, Reformation, right? So all of Christendom was upended. And then flowing from that, uh, 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 the whole secular world was changed. Okay, something akin to that on that scale is happening today, right? Where there had been, again, in our own way, a, a pretty uh, uh, um, homogeneous orthodoxy of information held and controlled by a hierarchy of uh, scholars, journalists, opinion makers, because the access to distribution of information was limited. Limited uh, technologically, limited by money, limited by privilege. Okay, so then the internet came along. You and I talked about this in, uh, in Cabo. And with the advent of the internet, it was a very exciting time because people felt like now we will have access to all the world's information and we can connect all the world's people. A very, very optimistic uh, period in the 90s where we thought that this was going to uh, elevate uh, uh, humanity. And in part, it has, but also it's had all these unattended consequences, right? So now there's a chaos of information. And uh, now we're at the advent of the next, so quickly, the next big revolution in the AI, which is uh, uh, you know just dawning as we speak. 
Yes, and talking about the border, Jeff, uh, the mm. responsibility, it's huge because on one side, you are the San Diego Union Tribune. I mean, your community is San Diego, but no, who's from San Diego? Who are commuters? Yeah. Who work in San Diego and live in Tijuana? So which one would you say that it's your your um, the most hard to 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 cover talking about the border on on mm. fake news and on yeah yeah mm -hmm. well i mean the border coverage obviously very important right this is essential to the identity of both cities is that just like in your illustration there we are you know cheek by jowl so and there are of course tens of thousands of people who are crossing every single day every day through that uh, very difficult traffic that we've all created and all these barriers to to uh, to fortify the border, right? In spite of all that, we're a border region. To your question about the challenges, I do think that there's profound challenges in particular in the coverage of Tijuana. This, this goes to... Um, uh, uh, the whole philosophy and uh, initiative around the Innovadora, right? So as journalists, we face this challenge, like how do you, how we portray ourselves is very formative. That whole information system I was talking about, what we say about ourselves is, uh, is a powerful, uh, a powerful force in our communities and how we perceive ourselves and where we go. So it's a big responsibility. Um, and I think that, you know, the challenging part is dealing with uh, issues like violence and rule of law versus issues about culture and achievement and business, the rest of life, right? And um, I'm not sure I know the right answer. I, I felt like I was doing a good job uh, until uh, uh, a year ago, a year almost two years ago now, a year and a half ago, uh, after the murders of uh, uh, um, Margarito uh, Martinez and Lourdes Maldonado, I, I had this moment. We had purchased photos uh, from Margarito's widow, his work, because we wanted to honor him and showcase his work. Okay, Margarito's work is very gritty. He he what he would do would be to listen to the police calls and rush around the city, taking these pictures of these terrible crimes and then selling them for a pittance to the to the local uh, local websites and press in uh, Tijuana. Very difficult life. Uh, so I so we bought these pictures. And these are pictures typically we would not run. You know, very gruesome. And but there was a problem. They didn't have the captions. What who is this person? What is when was it taken? And uh because of the chaos of the family, still in the middle of uh, grieving, and uh not good access to Margarito's personal filing system, you know. Uh I spent maybe uh, four or six hours just looking, doing Google search for his images. And I knew the sites where he had published them. So I was like scrolling through, scrolling through hour after hour. And I, I'll tell you, even though we, we all know that there's these, you know, violence and things happening. Uh, and by the way, this isn't unique to Tijuana. But spending all that time looking at it, then I thought, oh, my God, have I been doing the right thing? Like, because we've sort of turned turned away from that, right? Because, the, because of all the problems that would accompany centering that narrative that's very damaging, uh, traumatizing to the city, uh, 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 empowering the, uh, the, the uh, forces. Of violence. We don't want to do that. But I'll tell you, after spending that time, I felt like, oh, I feel like I'm stepping right over the bodies. You know, like it's a very big dilemma 
How, what is the right thing to do? So, you know, the longer I have spent engaged in this work, the more uncertain I think I've become about, you know, how to find the right thing to do. It's very difficult. When I went to Tijuana, when I came to Tijuana, my father, it was 20,000 people living in Tijuana, 50,000 yeah. people living in San Diego in 1946. Wow. I say, don't, don't see the border. Don't, to take advantage of both worlds, you, you should get the best of, of both worlds, of both countries. And it has, I, has, has been my motto in my life. But you especially, you are a very sensitive person. People, you are very sweet. I have seen you with your children. Can you tell me about your family? Uh, yeah. And I yeah, have, yeah. We, have, we have have breakfast together. Right, right. And you know, my 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 youngest one, she misses those a lot. She asks me once in a while because she wants those uh, those pancakes. waffles. Uh, yeah, or it was the waffle, right? Uh, uh, and by the way, those breakfasts you have—that's such an important little piece of community, right? Uh, but yeah, my my family. Uh, I have two uh, two uh, daughters, both adopted. Uh, my youngest is 12. My oldest is 19. And today is her birthday. Today, as soon as we're done, I have to run to the dinner. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're all, you know, we're very, uh, we're very lucky to, like, you know, have families here in this, you know, such a beautiful part of the world where we all live. Uh, we're really blessed. Next year, we are going to have both in both countries, change of a president or, mm. or, or elections. Uh, we are, we are, in, and many things are moving in those, in this, this year from mm. today. What, what, how do you foresee the future of the, this presidency if they come and what they, what, what, what they can bring us, what things they can bring us, who can bring you peace, bring us peace, oh. and prosperity, who cannot, what do you think? Well, that's a very hard question. I'm going to go back for a second to the family, because I, I think you don't know this about me, and I, I left this out. Um, okay. I, I, I actually, my wife and I were married uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Mexico, just south of Rosarito, in Calafia, Back when just going to Mexico was like it was just part of being you know, Southern Californian, right? And think about how the world's changed. Like now, it's like so difficult. And, and by the way, there at Calafia, now they've built a giant, some sort of giant uh, condo tower right there on top of the, you know, the little honky tonk hotel and the and the there, there's like a little historic site there. So that's how our world's changed. Um, Okay, so anyway, to, to your question, the presidential elections, my, my gosh, uh, uh, very unpredictable, I think, early and very unpredictable. Like, uh, I feel like on the U.S. side, people see that they think they know where it's going. It will be a showdown between Biden and Trump. Uh, I'm not so confident that is what will happen, you know, just because... There's a lot of variability. These are some very elderly people, by the way. Um, so who knows uh, how that's going to go? Very, uh, very consequential, I think, as well. And on the Mexico side, I should be asking you because I, I mean I don't have that insight. We we have a very interesting election now. Okay, Claudia. Yeah. So Jeff. I would like to to go to your story as a journalist and because um, in your bio, it says that you were in New York mm -hmm. and in Buffalo. So how come you came to the border and when uh, you start seeing you as a border person? Yeah, yeah. Good question. Well, by the way, I grew up right on the border of Canada in Buffalo. So that is a border city. And uh, um, where I grew up, we were a few, like maybe uh, two miles from the border, right? So pretty close. And then uh, after I, I had gone off to college, my parents moved right to the where uh, Lake Erie and the Niagara River joined. So right at the border. And like here, that was, you know, we used to go back and forth 
to Canada, you know, every weekend for for fun to go to the lake because the beer was better there because like very similar reasons, right? Uh, uh, and uh, by the way, you know, now we we've all moved away after my my parents died, so there's none of the family left in Buffalo. But um, I believe that too has changed, just like our border has changed. The wall that makes it very difficult to go back and forth. Um, so uh, to get back to your question, I, uh, I, I grew up in Buffalo. Uh, my dad was the editor of the local paper. I went off to uh, college uh, at Brown. I studied uh, 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 creative writing and semiotics, which is like the academic um, discipline of how things mean things, basically, right? Um, which was very, uh, very uh, popular uh, uh, and new area of scholarship uh, back in the 80s when I was in college. But I think it's fallen out a little bit out of favor. I'm not sure they have that program anymore. Um, so, so then I got toward the end of college. And um, uh, I was pretty good at going to college. And I thought like, well, maybe I'll go to law school. And I had a big stack of law school applications in my apartment. And I was writing a, a thesis on, <laughs> it wasn't my favorite class, on pre, pre-Raphaelite poetry. And on my wall, because this was before, your listeners will, uh, some of them be shocked by this, although you two won't. So of course, before computers. So, because uh, I graduated from college in 1982. And so on my wall, I, you know, literally we would cut and paste. So I had all my notes and parts of books, an entire thesis covering the wall. And it was a beautiful spring day. And I just remember having this moment and thinking, you know what, I, 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 I'm sort of done with this. <laughs> so I, I did not send in my uh, law school applications. And instead, I uh, drove home toward my parents' house in Buffalo from Providence, Rhode Island, stopping in the different towns along the way, trying to get a journalism job, which was something, you know, I was interested in as a reader and as a writer um, and as, uh, you know, part of that little kitchen cabinet at my family home, but not not something I really was well-educated in at all. And I finally, in Syracuse, which you mentioned, got an internship that paid me very little. And there I learned during the summer, you know, oh, how do you do this job? And uh, to me, I, it began as a writing job. I thought of it as a task of writing. So if you read great journalistic books like um, like In Cold Blood by Truman Capote or Honored by Father by Gay Talese, these were like journalistic writing that was uh, virtuoso and inspiring to a young student like me. So I thought, oh, that's what I'll do. So I began that work. And over time, I learned it's not really a writing job. It's a community service job. That's really what's happening. Um, and I think that's hard for young people maybe to perceive, or maybe not young people today, but when, when I was a young person, that was hard for me to perceive. Um, so eventually then I, I moved out to Orange County uh, for a job that they had there that paid more and had warmer weather. Syracuse is a fantastic place. You, it's a community where you can drive 20 minutes in any direction and be in the beautiful countryside, but also where when you step in the snow drift, when you're starting your car in the morning, the snow goes over your boot and into your shoe. And uh, that's what happened to me. I, I stepped in that that snowdrift one time too many, and sort of like that moment with the essay in college, just at once it came to me, ah, enough of the snow in the boot. So I, you know, I took the job all the way out here in California, and uh, I, I worked in Orange County for you know more than a decade and came to try to learn that community. That's really when I came to learn Baja, right? Because when that, you know, when we were married, we were living up in Orange County. I hadn't come to San Diego yet. It just became part of our lives, right? Um, 
And then I, I, you know, you had the rest of that bio. I came down to San Diego in 2010 and uh, set about trying to learn our community, right? And I think that's probably when I met both of you because that would have been the original years of the Innovadora, right? Was it? Wouldn't don't you date also maybe to 2011 or 2010? 2009. Oh, 2009. Okay, so I came just the second year. I remember coming down, seeing like, oh, Al Gore is going to come and speak about the inconvenient truth. I'm gonna, I got to be there. I drove down, and uh, sat in the uh, Sakut in the big uh, auditorium and watched the different speak. It was a fantastic experience. And I remember thinking, whoever put this together, whoever the, whoever did this, this is quite an achievement. Amazing. An amazing achievement. So, I mean, that's how, uh, that was right at the very beginning of my own journey in really connecting to traveling to Tijuana, you know, being there regularly, making it a part of my life. Um, uh, which, by the way, has really been disrupted post-pandemic. You know, like for me, uh, that created a giant gap that hasn't really been filled. And I wonder about the rest of the community. Okay, today there is 3 million people living in San Diego, 2 million people, close to 3 million people in the area with Ensenada and everything. We have 6 million, as I told you, I came when we were 20,000 in Tijuana and 50,000 in San Diego. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Well, this has been, is getting stronger and bigger. Tijuana exports about 200 million every day. There is a lot of Americans living in Tijuana, but right, right. now, the second uh, city in the area of San Diego is Tijuana, of Americans, is Tijuana. The second city, more than Chula Vista, more than National City. Many oh, so are, more, more, more Americans in Tijuana than in Chula Vista. In, and, and that's, a very other, that's a very interesting data point. Only, only downtown. We have become a, a Tijuana pyjama. Everybody sleeps, many people are sleeping there. And working here. So many things are happening, very interesting things. They, they are getting stronger. There is a new way to that we are letting China alone. And the United States is bringing the, the, the business to Mexico, to factories. Many, many important things are happening. What, how do you see this future of this huge amount of people yeah. that are coming? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, the, um, when I was born in Buffalo, 1960, I, I believe at that year, Buffalo was larger than San Diego. Think about that. And uh, now here in a single lifetime, everything has changed, right? Uh, 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 the largest cities in America, with the exception of New York, maybe Philadelphia, like probably seven out of the 10 largest cities in America are west of the Mississippi. The whole world has changed. And so now San Diego, the second biggest city in California, Tijuana, the second biggest city in, uh, in Mexico. Amazing. Uh, so, so what does that future hold? I mean, to me, it seems a place of tremendous promise, right? I think I've told you the story. Uh, 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 I was on a flight to uh, to Singapore years ago, and I'm watching, you know, so many movies. It's a very long flight, and at the end of every movie, they have a little uh, a commercial from the from the government of Singapore, and here's what they say: no excise tax, no value added tax. No income tax. There might be an income tax. It's a long list of the reasons that Singapore became such a powerhouse simply by its location and its tax policy. So I think we have, of course, the exact same opportunity here at our border, right? We have all the potential energy of these two places that are so similar, but also very, very different, right? different strengths right next to each other. And I think, you know, a really 
visionary uh, uh, administration, or maybe it would take both, would find that way to make this a center of global trade that would surpass uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, and the other uh, uh, Asian ports on the other side, which grew, which don't have all the advantages that we have. So, um, Jeff, I, I would like to to talk about a little bit about the, the the work that you guys are doing here in the border because I know that you have a, a web page and also mm -hmm. you have an edition in Spanish and mm -hmm. as a, a as a local uh, newspaper I know that uh, you have limited resources no yeah it's not the same as a huge um, newspaper that have you know reporters and right. journalists in the whole country so uh, I, and i really know that you um you really fact check information you always verify your your sources you uh try to be you know your narratives got to be really um really true no so how are you dealing with with this new challenge that all the newspapers have And and how is the San Diego Union Tribune doing it? Because for us uh, in the border, uh, the San Diego Union Tribune is really really important, and it's it's like our our newspaper. You know, right. it doesn't matter that we're in San Diego or in 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 Tijuana. Yeah, I mean, of course, resources are limited, right? And uh, uh, people that we have living in Tijuana or covering Tijuana, you can basically count them on one hand. Lilia O'Hara, who's the editor of UTN Español. Uh, Alexandra Mendoza, uh, who writes uh, uh, extensively uh, about Tijuana in Spanish. Uh, Lucia Serrano, uh, who does both writing and, uh, and translation. She had a very nice piece today on the 20th anniversary of the Culinary Arts uh, Institute uh, in, in Tijuana. Uh, Alejandro Tamayo, who's a photographer and videographer, uh, really uh, experienced uh, Tijuana Hand. Tanya Navarro, in our opinion section, um, uh, who worked uh, uh, for years as a journalist at different outlets in, uh, in Tijuana. Uh, we've got Kate Morrissey covering uh, immigration. So that's like, I don't know, like six, six or seven people, right? Uh, and I've been thinking about this a bit because we're searching for uh, one more journalist uh, to fill the shoes of Wendy Fry, who moved on to um, to Cal Matters. And so, like, people ask me, well, what are you looking for? And I think it maybe it's still, to me a little bit different to me than what the way you described it, Claudia, because... I don't think we can really be Tijuana's media, right? We have like one half step removed because we need far more people if we're going to tell you everything that's going on in town, right? I mean, we don't we don't come anywhere close to that. But I, I think the answer is can be seen maybe like in a little bit of the tradition of the reporters we've had. So Sandra Dibble. Fantastic journalist, spent decades covering uh, Tijuana. And her approach, I think, was that of uh, a, a cultural exploration. That's how I saw uh, Sandra's uh, heart and her, uh, her, uh, her purpose. You know, she came from National Geographic. She had this global perspective and a, and a powerful interest in the cultures of the world, and then fell in love with Tijuana and tried to tell the story of the culture of Tijuana. So I think she was speaking to that kind of, uh, th that audience of people like her, people who love the cultures of the world. She came from a diplomatic family, an amazing story, uh, Sandra. Okay, then Wendy Fry uh, was the next person. Wendy had a background in television news. So wow. Wendy was very driven by uh, uh, the news of the day, 
much more uh, straightforward, um, faster moving, very aggressive reporter, also a fantastic journalist in a very different way. I think what I would like to, to find, though, is somebody who can tell the story of the binational experience more from the inside out, right? Meaning like the essential question of journalism is, hey, what's going on in my community? What's going on in my community? Okay, so to me, the definition of the community here is that binational community, right? People who uh, live back and forth or part of their family lives back and forth or we used to live in TJ, now we live in San Diego. So, so the things that are of interest and importance to that community, that, that's to me really the right way to, to cover Tijuana for us, right? Like I don't think uh, the task is to try to command the attention of people who are outside the community, who don't care, right? Because we can see, there's all sorts of people who don't care about all sorts of things. We should be writing about the people, our people, the people who really care. So that, so in, in, not in the sense of every moment, every day, but understanding what is of significance in this community, right? Who are the, what are the events, the traditions, the people, the companies that matter? And to write about it that way, that's, I, that's, what, that's, uh, that's what we're looking for. One of the problems also, or not precisely a problem, is what's the business of Tijuana or what's the business of San Diego? What, where, what, where we make money in both sides of the border? Mm. We have now a medical area. I will tell you that more than six new hospitals, the value is more than a hundred million dollars each one. Also about six uh, or seven shopping centers has developed in Tijuana. And there also the the the, uh, yeah. the area of uh, the Guadalupe Valley has become a tourist area. So we we are, we have been growing in Tijuana and we have been growing in San Diego. And I think that you have become uh, the bridge to understand each other. What do you think about that? I I think uh, there's great potential there. It's very flattering that you would say that, but I do think I do think we're an important bridge. I think the story that we tell ourselves about who we are is formative for all of us. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think um, in particular, we, we should have more insight into discussion of the world of business uh, across the two communities. Um, I think we've done... Uh, uh, a, a good job in terms of housing and development and, um, you know, the whole uh, 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 living cross-border, the whole uh, uh, build-up of, of TJ. Um, uh, those stories we've done, but I think there are, there, and of course the uh, Valle is something that's been well covered, not just by us, but by, you know, the big publications of the globe. It's an amazing place. Um, I think there's more going on than we've been able to get to. So I think that's an important area for us. I think we could do better. You know, there's also a, a, a medical device industry, um, which is very large. Uh, many different categories. We could go down the list. We, we share the airport. It's very interesting <laughs> what's happening with the airport. It's the only airport in the world that's binational in a way that you fly from where, from China and you can go to San Diego, cruise, you don't come to Tijuana, or you go, you can cross to Tijuana, whatever, whatever you want to be. It's very interesting, the experiment. Whatever yeah, yeah, that was brilliant, brilliant. And uh, uh, yeah, I, of course, have used that airport, as uh, I'm sure we all have. Uh, terrific experience. You know, going back, I'd like to go back and look. Did people see risk there? Did they know it would be a giant hit? Did they have a question? Because, you know, that has just been uh, fantastic from day one. I guess you look at, like, the number of people in San Diego who hold a passport. It's like a really low number. 
So maybe they did see risk, right? Well, I, I, I don't know, but when I when I, I I have been in the in the cross border in this month like twice or three times, I guess, and the you know the the Mexican line was three or four people, and the American <laughs> the foreigners line was like huge. So I don't know if they see a risk or not because if they are no. have the both both nationalities, they they could go to the Mexican, you know. No, no, yeah. I, what I meant, Claudia, was more the business risk in in this whole investment, right? Nobody had done it before. Oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. It's two different countries. Will there be enough business? I feel like uh, uh, the first time I went there. Oh, oh, we were going, uh, we were going to La Paz, and then we were going to go across and see the whales. The, the entire parking lot was completely full, and there was like the auxiliary lots. They were still being be, be, being created, right? They, they, you could tell they like they had to build extra parking lots very quickly. It was such a hit. Um, so I think they underestimated how strong it would be. Right? Very interesting. Another part, another many, many people, young people from Tijuana cross every day, every day to go to schools in San Diego. Right. Good schools. And we, the relationship with the American, with the universities between the Tijuana and American universities are excellent now. We we have become a little bit more friendly every day. Mm. We, we have a book that we wrote together, San Diego and Tijuana. The, the, it's, it's about the emotions and the uh, and the and the, the business possibilities of, of both sides. Right. The good things are happening. Very good. Yeah, things. Alan's Alan Burson's uh, uh, book, right? Alan Burson's precisely. Yeah, He's yeah, a yeah. That is interesting guy. He's a very he, interesting guy. But mm -hmm. you, you, you know, I would say, uh, for all of our optimism. And all the places where we see where people have really underestimated the power of this relationship. I also run into like uh, all sorts of friction, always. Like, I'll, here, I'll give you an example. Uh, and maybe this is, this is before the pandemic. So, you know, it's got to be five years ago now. Uh, oh. I, I had an idea. We'll do uh, a class in personal journalism. At uh, uh, at City College, with bo about border life, and actually the idea for this came when I was at uh, Southwestern College, and uh, a bunch of the students were the very people you were talking about, uh, 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 Senor Galico. They were kids who crossed every day. So I tried to reach out to Southwestern, and I couldn't get a hold of anybody. And then I thought, well, of course, these kids, of course, are at City College. We'll work with them. And they've got a whole media department. And uh, I talked to the uh, professors there who were very welcoming, and we put this class together. And the idea was we will tell the real story of the border through the eyes of young people who are living and crossing every day passionate young people, poets, right? Right, the, the, the young voices. Uh, and this was at a, at a time, it was like Trump was president, right? So like, what's the real story? So I went to the class and I gave this uh, inspirational speech. And the idea was maybe we'd get uh, uh, 15 people in this class. And so if they each only had to write something, one, once every two weeks, one thing every two weeks, which I think a college student could definitely do, we would have something fresh every day on our border blog, every single day. Uh, and we had other extravagant ideas about like uh, uh, getting people to just tell a story from the line every day. And then we, you know, one hour on the line, who's there with you? People are born on that line. And people die on that line as well. <laughs> Everything happens on that line. And we thought, we'll get celebrities. We'll get celebrities to, to wait in the line and tell their story. So we had all this enthusiasm. Here's what happened. The administration at City College said, okay, but you can't have anybody crossing the border. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, you, you don't understand. The students 
live in Tijuana and come to City College downtown in San Diego, they cross the border every day. What do you mean they can't be crossing the border? No, nobody can cross the border to, uh, as part of this class. So, and even getting that answer, no, took like months. So there was this perception that it's too dangerous and that, 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 the, that the trustees couldn't say yes, because what if something happened? And so like that reflex, and I'm sure both of you run into this reflex everywhere. No, no. Oh, but it's across. No, we can't do it. It's across the border. So it, uh, although I share your enthusiasm, I also sort of see not everybody shares our enthusiasm, right? Yeah, that's true. There are many and, and people who, who don't understand the border, both sides of the border, and they, they have me misunderstanding of what's happening. And we are in a beautiful region. And we, the people who understand that, that can, as my father told you, told me, is you have to take advantage. There are many good things. We have better tortillas in Tijuana. <laughs> Claudia. Yeah, um, I just want to say that on the Facebook, uh, hello from Janet Sanchez, from, from Paco Reyes. And uh, receive a chat where Hector Vanegas is also on the on the Facebook. And every time you say something, there comes the um, the the happy face, the sad face, the <laughs> loving face. Sure. So they're following you. So th that's yeah. Great. If there are questions from the chat, uh, uh, let's let's hear them. So uh, here, here's um, a, a question. Before our time goes, is um, when somebody uh, on the on the media that do not live in the border ask you to share some information, so what would you say that are the strengths of the San Diego Union Tribune and um, you, you and all your team um, about uh, journalism covering the border, your strengths? Yeah, I'd say in that context, our strengths are that we live here. Right. So in journalism, as in life, accountability comes from relationships. Right. So you'll notice when there's some big story on the border and here comes the national media, who are also just ordinary people, because that's the only kind there are. They're trying to do their job. Uh, they tell a different story than the story we see. And then they leave. Because they they don't have the full context, and they don't have the follow up of people telling them what the heck, what was that? That wasn't right. Because they've moved on. So the strength of of uh, of our organization is its roots in, in the local community. Right now, the weakness is we're also humans. We, we're we're limited. We don't always get it right. We, we, we miss some parts, we're distracted. All those things happen. But the essential strength is we are here pursuing the truth to the best of our ability and showing up every day to find out how is that playing, right? Um, you know, I'd say the other thing, Claudia, that uh, we try to do is support one another and support uh, our colleagues in... Uh, in Baja, we run with the uh, U.S. Mexico Center from San Diego, from UCSD, a, a, a journalism contest that awards uh, cash awards to the best uh, journalism in Baja to encourage people who are working, um, you know, often under very difficult circumstances. Uh, uh, and when I say that, I don't mean in terms of safety, although I think that's an issue for journalists everywhere. But just in terms of making a living as, as a journalist uh, in, in Tijuana, harder, harder than it is on the U.S. side. And I, I really feel like we owe it to our, the community of journalists to, to, to support one another and help, help each other out. Actually, there's a comment from, from Patricia. They say maybe they can write, uh, at, maybe she's talking about your class. It says mm. maybe they can write daily, like the film Freedom Writers. You know, you I, know I haven't seen the film Freedom Writers, but uh, I would uh, I'd love to hear more about that. 
yeah, we should try this class again because it was a great passion of mine. I tried it two years in a row. The first time I was like, oh my God, it didn't work. But now they know what we're talking about. We'll try again. Oh, it's still, still, ah, you know how it is. Maybe uh, it wasn't the right time. You're full of ideas, Jeff. Uh, why don't you share about this prize of border journalists that you did, the work you're doing with the media, with Ethan Ventrilo? Why don't you share with, with the people that is looking at us? Well, I think we just talked about the the uh, uh, the Baja journalism uh, prizes, which I think was important. We also have um, annually a... Uh, uh, a Migrant Voices Film Challenge. This started after um, the, uh, the big migrant uh, uh, caravans. So uh, uh, at, at that point, there was like a sensation at the border. Remember, the uh, uh, migrants rushed the border. They ran across the riverbed and tear gas was fired. They shut down the border. Um, that attracted not just the national and international media to come and tell the story. It also attracted independent voices, independent filmmakers of all sorts who could tell those stories. So um, we worked with the, um, uh, the Latino Film Festival organizers from San Diego to do a, a short film documentary challenge. So now it's in the fifth year. Um, I've seen amazing things amazing little pieces that people submit uh, about um, uh, about the border experience. And I'm just smiling because I always feel like every year, the one that wins, I always think, well, that's not even the best one. There's so many, look at this one. Um, <laughs> there are like, incre I'll share them with both of you because there are incredible stories in there. Like I'm thinking of one with like a woman singing with her own little karaoke machine that she's carried with her from like Guatemala all the way to the border, standing by the fence. And she's great. She's great. Her voice is not perfect, but her spirit and the story, uh, it's so good and so genuine. Um, and we expanded that this year to uh, stories of other borders. So there were entries from Syria. There, uh, uh, Oh, my God. I, I, the winner this year, a beautiful animated piece from a woman from Texas who told the story of the border there. Uh, it's so inspiring to see the creative vision of uh, people. You know, I think, and I, I know we're almost out of time. This goes to some of the questions you've been asking, Claudia. The idea of journalism is that the same facts can mean different things to different people. So seeing through somebody else's eyes, that's the gold, right? And I feel like if we could embrace independent voices, as well as mainstream voices, then we really begin to see and understand in a different way. So that's that's a little bit of what we're trying to do at the border and in other nooks and crannies as well. We need another hour, Jeff. So Mr. <laughs> you guys are so good. is going to ask you for your final words, what do you want to share with uh, the people that is uh, hearing you? And also, gracias a Gaby Palazuelos, always, all the time. Just backstage. Adelante, señor Galicot. It has been amazing uh, to hear you in different facts and ideas that we didn't share before. And uh, it makes me need more of these talks to, with, to you, to know you more. It has been a beautiful experience. And please, what would you like to say to the younger generation for, for the, the way that they should manage the the, uh, the newspapers, the news. Yeah, first of all, th thank you for having me because I really, I really very much enjoyed this. You and I now, we've known each other for years, but to have this opportunity, right, to answer questions, I feel like um, it was, uh, you know, a, a real learning and sharing experience. So we should definitely do that more. Okay, here's, I guess, what I would say. We all should be thinking about our information hygiene differently, right? Uh, uh, because I think we are not quite aware of the extent to which the digital media world uh, has provided 
uh, a behavioralist's laboratory, right? Because now we can see, oh, if I give this to Don Jose, he does that. Interesting. And we can do that at scale, very granularly, and we can understand the human behavior better than ourselves as individuals, right? So it's like the effect of advertising. Uh, uh, if they play a lot of ads that say Coke is it, yeah, as a consumer, you think, well, I know it's just an ad. Coke isn't it. It's just the ad. But then, like zombies, when we go to the store, you can completely correlate the market share. Everybody buys the Coke. Why? Because you're in, the information that goes in is shaping you. And so now this goes w way beyond uh, uh, soda advertising. And some, some of the topics we touched on at the very beginning, what I think, my ideas about reality, the values I have, how I will treat other people, all of these things are at risk if I'm not careful about my information consumption. So I think we all are going to need to have a lot more care about the things we expose ourselves to going forward. I don't know where it's going to take us. It's a pretty interesting time. So with that, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much, Jeff. It was a pleasure to have you in our webinar A Tiempo y Bien. Gracias, señor Galicot. Gracias a Gaby Palazuelos y a todas las personas que nos acompañaron el día de hoy en este webinar. Muchas, muchas gracias, Lupe Torres. Torrija, muchas gracias por acompañarnos y nos vemos la próxima semana en este webinar a tiempo y bien en su eh, edición binacional. Vamos a estar con eh, Joaquín Luquen, que es el director ejecutivo de Smart Border Coalition el próximo jueves aquí a tiempo y bien a las seis de la tarde hora pacífico. Muchas gracias. Thank you for being here. Gracias. Tijuana. 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 Tijuana is innovation and manufacturing at a world-class level. A skilled and high-tech industrial labor. The San Diego's business and economic partner. Is the gateway to a smarter border. Is a dynamic destination and our gateway to Mexico. Is diverse and inclusive. Is binational and bicultural. Is a hub of art and cultural innovation. Is surprising. A place that will open your eyes. Is a treasure trove of wonderful food, beer, and wine. Is part of San Diego's binational community. Is social innovation and philanthropy. Is San Diego's innovative, dynamic, and vibrant collaborator. Tijuana is an open and plural society, a cluster of many communities that welcomes everyone. Tijuana is our friend, our neighbor, and our partner. Tijuana. 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 Tijuana is the future. Tijuana. 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 Tijuana is innovation and manufacturing at a world class level. A skilled and high tech industrial labor. Is San Diego's business and economic partner. Is the gateway to a smarter border. Is a dynamic destination and our gateway to Mexico. Is diverse and inclusive. Is